Thank you, Oli, and thank you all for coming. A uh, big thank you to ONT for inviting me here, and for, to Lucy, Claire, Tim, and Luis for helping me with the talk. So I know I'm between you and the coffee and the popcorn, so we'll try to keep it exciting and short. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we are using um, uh, the MINA and Oxford Nanopore technology to, for, for conservation of sharks and rays. So you might ask, why sharks and rays? Why save them? Because for most of us, the sharks are defined by their fear, uh, by our fear of them. But contrary to regular belief, sharks are actually quite adorable, like this one here. Um, this is a whale shark that we were sampling in La Paz, Mexico. So they are kind of gentle giants, generally. They are also very crucial to uh, healthy oceans and for the health of humans. Sharks are often apex predators, so they're at the top of the food chain, so they're really important for top-down regulation of oceanic ecosystems. They keep mesopredators in check, like I'm showing in the middle pa panel, and that is really important to maintain coral reefs, because if you don't, if you don't have sharks, then the mesopredators are going to go up, which reduces the population of herbivores, and that causes increase in invasive algae, which destroys coral reefs. And it also, uh, increase in mesopredators reduces commercial fish stocks, which we heavily rely on. Sharks are also really important to the economy because of the ecosystem services that they provide that I just told you about. And also they make direct and indirect contributions to, eco uh, to ecotourism. So based on a study in the Bahamas, a live shark is worth $250,000, whereas a dead shark is worth $50. Sharks are also cool in many other ways. So they are one of the oldest extant vertebrates today. The first cartilaginous fish, which was called the chimeras, evolved around 540 million years ago. And it looks a little bit strange. It, look, it has a lot of lines on it, which seems like, makes it look like a lot of different sharks have been sewn together. That's why they're called chimeras. And after that, around, 500, around 420 million years ago, the ancestor of what we know as sharks today came to be. And then there was the batoids, which are the flatter cousins of the sharks. So all of these together form um, the class chondrichthys, which is cartilaginous fish, and there are about 1,200 species. So as I told you, they've been around for a really long time. So they are very evolutionary resilient. They also have very long life histories. So they live for a really long time. The Greenland shark is known to live for about 500 years. And they also take a really long time to mature. So there's an emerging problem here. Everything is about sharks. It's really long. Like They have really long names. Like Who calls themselves chondrichthys? So, <laughs> um, so, to, so for my sanity and yours, I'm going to refer to all of these folks as sharks, even though they're different forms of uh, chondrichthys. So, jokes apart, what contributes to their long uh, life histories and uh, their evolutionary resilience is extraordinary genome stability, because they're large animals and they live for a really long time, which increases the chances for genetic mutations and such. But they have very good genome stability. They also have extraordinary wound healing and immune function which allows them to live for such a long time. So they're very cool biological specimens and living fossils that we need to study. However, in spite of them being such charismatic megafauna that are so important to our ecosystems, we are fishing them out. So on average, every year, 300 million sharks are fished out of our oceans. Compared to that, there have been 20 attacks on humans in the last two decades from sharks, so they should be more scared of us than us of them. And most of this shark fishing is done to fuel the shark fin trade, which is, then goes to the shark fin soup industry. And because finning 
is illegal, so you can't just take the fin and drop the rest of the shark. There are secondary industries that have come up. So the gill rakers are now used in uh, traditional medicine, and the meat is used um, for consumption like any other fish. And it has also made its way into human food. And then there's liver oil, squalene, cartilage, all kinds of things, products that are derived from sharks. And that has caused something like this for a lot of the shark species that are targeted. So there have been 80 to 90% declines in a lot of these species. And globally, this is what that looks like. So globally, about 40 to 50% of the shark species out of the 1,200 are threatened. And they are constant, the, the most threatened species are found in these areas which are shown here in uh, red. And they coincide with areas which have the highest landing share. So these areas are involved in the largest amounts of shark fishing. Interestingly, these areas also coincide with the highest levels of data deficiency. So what do I mean by data deficiency? It means that we don't have enough information in terms of spe species distribution and their population size to assess their conservation status. So if you don't know enough about a species, it's just really easy to take them out and do whatever we want with it because nobody is really noticing. So this is a grim picture. How do we, how do we correct it? So when we think about conserving remaining populations, there are several pieces of key information that we need. One is, the first is we need to determine, um, uh, have a method of determining species identities to track which sharks are being targeted the most in the wildlife trade. We need to figure out what is the population size of each of these species. So now when we think of population size, we need to know the population structure. Does each species consist of one big population, or is it many subpopulations that may or may not interbreed? And then we need to know what is the distribution like for each of these populations or subpopulations. And lastly, what are the threats that affect each of these populations of sharks? So currently, most of the methods are focused here on identification of species. And this kind of takes us back to Dan's talk yesterday about PCR not being the best. So these methods to identify sharks are based on uh, amplicon sequencing, where they sequence a 200 to 800 base pair, 600 base pair fragment of the cytochrome oxidase gene. So many of the species can have identical barcodes, which means we cannot differentiate between species or they simply just won't amplify using, even using universal primers. And lastly, accessibility is a big issue. The regions that I showed you which have the highest amounts of threat, not everybody, all of those people have access to PCR machines or to Sanger sequencing. Some of our sampling sites which have the highest amounts of uh, threat, the, the closest Sanger sequencing facility is about eight hours away where you need to drive, and then after that, you have to wait 24 hours to get back the results. Also, um, these methods don't address the other issues of which are other pieces of information which are really important in determining conservation and management strategies. So we wanted to come up with a method which is truly universal in the sense that can be applied to all species, and that can be used for anywhere, that can be used anywhere by anybody. And we did come up with that method, and it was recently covered by National Geographic. Um, so what is this method? So in terms of universal access, we asked ourselves, could we come up with a method where we just simplify it, where we just take DNA from whatever tissue source, fin or meat or whatever, and can we just sequence it directly on a single flow cell and get regions that are, would allow us to determine taxonomic ID as well as determine population size structure and also understand species biology if possible. 
And that kind of is tricky because there are five shark genome sequences so far, and they range in size from one to seven gigabases, which is pretty big. So for example, for taxonomic identification, we would need access to the mitochondrial DNA. And we were like, how do we isolate mitochondrial DNA from such a big nuclear genome? So we got suggestions like, you know, why don't you put your tissue in a tube and just stand there and just spin it around and separate the <laughs> mitochondrial and nucleus uh, uh, sections. But thankfully, we didn't have to do it. We actually just took genomic DNA, did whole genome sequencing on, the, on a single flow cell, and we were actually able to get deep sequencing or high coverage of high copy number regions, which included the mitochondrial and other nuclear sequences. And this was recently published in uh, scientific reports. We took, put this method to use in the field in India, which is the second largest supplier of sharks in the world. Uh, so as you can see, this area here is India. And as you can see, it is, has one of the highest contributions to shark landings. Within India, the western state of Gujarat is the largest contributor to India's shark exports. And this is a typical scene from a fish market in India. So every kind of shark and ray is on the chopping block. And often the fins are separated. And at this point, there's no way to tell which shark it came from, whether it is legal or illegal. So we went to the market. We took a sample of whatever was available to us. We put it in RNA later, and then DNA, the DNA extraction, and then sequenced it on the menion. So we used one flow cell. Um, we sequenced it for 48 hours. And at the end of it, we got 74,000 genomic sequences. They ranged in length up to about 100 KB. And we got the mitochondrial and nuclear genomes with very high accuracy, with a very wide G GC percentage coverage and we were able to contribute to the sixth uh, partial genome of a shark. So what did that data look like? So out of the 74,000 reads, 47 reads form the mitochondrial uh, DNA contig. Of these 47 reads, we got some of them at about two minutes after the start of sequencing. We got majority of them within, the two, within two and a half to three hours, and then we got some at about 10 hours. So we could start determining species ID in two minutes, but we could most confidently determine our species ID at in, in within two hours, two to three hours. So it was really fast compared to Sanger sequencing for this place, which would take eight hours of driving and then 24 hours of waiting to determine species ID. This contig gave us the entire mitochondrial sequence, which was about 16,000 base pairs. And we were able to correct an existing mitochondrial genome for this uh, shark in the, in the database. We ran into one problem, which was our contig was actually longer than our mitochondrial genome. So all the ONT engineers, you just need to rest up. It's like too long. The sequences are too long. So we were first confused by it, but later we found that these contigs, the, the sequences which were beyond our genomic DNA length, actually also mapped back to the mitochondria. And we realized that this was probably coming from a replicating mitochondria, which undergoes rolling circle replication, and it was just uh, hadn't been cut yet within the cell, and that was making the contig longer than the genome. So that was an easy fix. Um, Using this entire mitochondrial DNA, which consists of the cytochrome oxidase barcode and several other barcodes, we were able to determine the ID as the silky shark or Carcharhinus falciformis. Yeah, long names. Um, so this is a situs protected species, meaning that trade in this species is illegal and is restricted because it is an endangered species. So we were able to detect illegal um, wildlife trade using this method. Um, coming back to capacity building and universal access. So we also wanted to come up with a method that, was, that involved the least amount of bioinformatics 
and that could be done anywhere without any fancy infrastructure. So we kind of developed two parallel methods. One was the field analysis, where we just took our reads that we got from um, the Minno software and put it into the software called Genius. And here we just said, map our reads to a reference mitochondrial genome, which was essentially any mitochondrial shark genome that was available in the database. And we had this downloaded on our computers. It was a local database. So we just mapped our reads directly to the shark genome, and this allowed us to get a pretty good contig. Then we took this contig and we aligned it to our local database again. And then we did phy phylogenetics in Genius as well, and this allowed us to determine the species ID in the field itself. So essentially, this is a super uh, friendly GUI interface which did not require any bioinformatics uh, just as yet. The second method was where we did all of the same things in the lab, where we had access to um, computing power, and we used the, the usual pipeline of assembling with Canu and then doing the usual uh, stuff. And both the results from here and here were quite comparable. However, from the second method, of course, because we were able to dig deeper into the data, we got a lot of mitochondrial, con uh, mitochondrial and nuclear contigs, as I'm showing you here. And these nuclear contigs consisted of very interesting genes, the homeobox genes, immune function and genome stability genes, as well as genes involved in endocrine function, which is super exciting because this had not been sequenced before for this shark species. And this allows us to now ask questions about species biology. We ran into some issues with alignment of low complexity uh, sequence regions, and I would love to talk to some of you after this about it. The second exciting thing was that our silky shark genome, or Calcarinus falciformis, ranged in GC content from 29 to 60%, which is a pretty wide range. And this has implications uh, for our method, use of our method in wildlife forensics. So some of the very heavily targeted uh, species in the illegal wildlife trade are the pangolins, elephants, sharks and rays, of course, and rhinos. So the pangolins are one of the most, uh, the, not one of the, the pangolins are the most trafficked animals in the world today. They are poached for their scales, again, in traditional medicine and meat. And they are at 37% average GC content. Then there's the elephants who are poached for their ivory. They're at 39%. And then there's sharks and rays, which range in GC content at about 42%. And then we have the rhinos, which are again poached for their horns in traditional medicine, um, which are at 51%. So because we had such good coverage across this GC range, our method could be used for wildlife forensics involving all of these different species. Um, oh, how does this method apply to all of you over here? So according to a recent study, 90% of fish and chip shops in the UK were detected, were found to have shark meat in the shop. And it's not that they are labeling it as something else and passing it on to you. Oftentimes, most of these shop owners or restaurant owners don't know they're actually selling shark meat. So the reason being that once the, sh the fins are removed, that is the most lucrative part of the shark. There is not much use for the meat. It's not that expensive. So there has to be some use for all of this meat. Um, so it often ends up in the human food. And we have shown that our method can detect all kinds of DNA, including degraded DNA from any sample type and from any species. So our method could be used for detecting uh, shark meat in human or pet food. So summarizing this part, um, we have sequenced the silky shark genome, as I told you, partially, and then we've also sequenced two manta ray genomes and one guitar fish genome. Uh, we continue to streamline these 
some of these hiccups that we had. We continue to engage in capacity building for wildlife forensics for all of these different species. Also, we are trying to reduce the cost of uh, Minayan use. So we are trying to do barcoding to multiplex and reduce the cost per sample. And in that regard, we have sequenced two shark genomes uh, in parallel on a single flow cell, and we again got a whole bunch of data. And lastly, we'll continue to dig uh, our data further to understand the population genetics and species biology. Switching gears just a little bit and talking about one last aspect of conservation, which I alluded to earlier, um, is monitoring shark populations. And I won't have time to go into detail in this, but I'm just going to go over it briefly. It is important to monitor these marine megafauna in light of all of the anthropogenic disturbances that we create in the environment today, and also because of environmental disturbances that happen naturally, like climate change. Microbiome, as we know, is known to be a very sensitive indicator of host health and environmental health. So we are studying microbial metagenomics in all of these different shark species all around the world, over, distributed over five different continents. Um, how do we sample sharks? So most often we try to study free-ranging wild shark populations. And to do that, we have come up with this suction device, which is called a super sucker. It, uh, it, create, it creates a seal on the shark skin. So remember, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're sampling underwater. So this is like taking a swab underwater. So for that, we have this device which creates a seal on the shark skin. And then we flood the shark skin with sterile water. And then flood, that flushes off the microbes off of the shark skin. And then we collect the sequence and do the rest of the spiel. And this is how that looks like. Our star graduate students he used to keep up with the shark. All right, so that's how we sample some of the shark um, microbiomes. We haven't tried swimming next to treasure sharks yet. So, <laughs> so for the other shark species with whom we can't swim, we bring them on board and uh, sample the microbiome and uh, send them back to where they were going. Undergrads are heavily involved in a lot of this work. Uh, microbial metagenomics form very integral to undergrad education and research training in our labs. So as you can see here, they are heavily involved in the sampling and then extraction and sequencing um, of these uh, mi microbiomes. And then they also take the data all the way to analysis where we are looking at taxonomy and function um, of the microbiomes. I can't tell, I don't have time to tell you more, but what we have noticed is that the shark uh, microbiomes are rich in heavy metal metabolizing uh, genes. So that could mean that there's biomagnification happening in our Southern California treasure sharks. Or it could also mean that it's part of their natural microbiome. We are still finding that out. So to end, we will continue our work with species ID and genome sequencing of the sharks. We'll also continue, we're also continuing our capacity building in terms of microbial metagenomics, and wildlife forensics using Minion and ONT technology. And lastly, we are we will be digging further into our data regarding that we have gotten from the genome skimming to understand population genetics, to monitor populations using the microbiome data, and then also to understand species biology with respect to genome stability and immune function. With that, I would like to thank uh, the Dinsdale Lab 
including Dr. Tinsdale, who's been the most phenomenal mentor, an amazing team of undergraduates and graduates, the Edwards Lab for their help with bioinformatics, our amazing collaborators all around the world, and lastly, all of the funding sources. Thank you.